It's a pleasure to be able to talk to you today. I'm very glad to have you on our show. Now, you left Iran when you were 17 and you've been living in the US and some other countries, I guess, uh, ever since then. And we've always seen you um, create in the Iranian context, if that makes sense. Now it's different. This is a very American setting. What changed? Well, I think uh, what changed uh, was the realization that um, you know, I may never go back to my own home country and that I have lived in the United States longer than I have lived in my own country. And therefore, I'm as American as I am Iranian and I can't live forever in the state of nostalgia. Um, and, you know, it was important for me to turn my point of view uh, to American society as it was going through so much changes. So it was a really a major turning point uh, for me, but I think it was very personal, as you said, not just artistic. You're from two countries, uh, if I may, that are in high contrast in the way that they're perceived in the global media and the way that, demonize, that they demonize one another. So in that sense, you said something interesting to the BBC. Uh, you said that it's a frightening idea for me that the US is starting to look more and more like Iran. Can you expand on that? Well, the truth is that um, more and more, uh, when you spend time at any society, let's say from Turkey to Germany to the United States, Iran, you begin to understand um, that there's always a, a level of corruption, tyranny, political injustice uh, from, from the top to the bottom, and, and also the idea of fanaticism. And, uh, and I think that for so long, the um, United States was represented as this land of dreams where it was inseparable from the rest of the world when the idea of democracy was the definition of America, you know? And, and it's really not true. Um, it's really not true. Sorry um, to cut you off there. Were, did you ever think this way or was it just the way yes. that the media was, okay, you... So no, I, I think that um, the American culture has changed quite a lot since I first arrived in late 70s, where I, you know, I truly, did find it as a, as a, as a kind of a place of safety, as a place of democracy, as a, uh, as a, as a place that gave home to many displaced people. But today's reality, it's, it's really different. I mean, I still love this country, but I'm able to criticize it and say that there has been a shift uh, in the American culture in terms of the rise of conservatism and white supremacy, the rise of fanaticism, um, the, the divide between the wealthy and the poor, the Republicans versus the liberals. And so I think that uh, in many ways, then United States, it's, it's a model of a nation that is not that different from many other complicated um, countries that um, are, you know, it's just not as good as it looks. And, and, and it's, and I feel like I can dare to criticize it, at least in this country, you have that freedom of expression. And was it under Trump that you got disillusioned with America? Well, I, I think there was this euphoric moment during Obama where with an African-American president, uh, we felt that was the United States was the ideal model for any nation. And, and that just turned catastrophic, in, in fact. Uh, had a really opposite consequences and the aftermath was Trump and his administration and an immediate, immediate impact on, let's say, a lot of immigrants and the poor and uh, any terrible foreign policy. For example, the, the Muslim ban and, and the idea of building wall with, against Mexico and some ridiculous ideas which again remember, reminded me of things that would happen in Iran. And so it was at this moment, I think it was a wake up call for many Americans, um, liberals or, um, or artists who, and, and in, for that matter, people who were immigrants who felt like their voice really mattered in terms of um, how they felt about all the changes that were happening in the American society and how it was their family's blood that created America. And, that we own America and we've given to America as much as it's given us. So it, this idea of 
racism and discrimination against whoever is not white is absolutely um, ridiculous and a hypocrisy. And now that the Trump era is over, do you feel like anything has changed? Not really. I think that, um, you know, I never believed that um, just the leader is uh, the one that is responsible for all the, you know, changes. I, I think there is this strong infrastructure of um, very, very wealthy um, corporate uh, models of people and companies that basically rule the country. Uh, and, um, and I think there is a, a great danger that, you know, um, the people who are lower middle class in America are, um, are going to see even worse times. And, and I think the worst part of it is American foreign policy. And I don't see how the current administration is doing a better job, for example, what happened in Afghanistan and than the previous one. So I, I really don't think that the leadership is the only thing that redefines the future. Mm -hmm. Is there any message you're trying to send with this project, Land of Dreams? Well, I think, you know, again, you know, I'm, I'm just a, what do you would consider a poet? I'm not an activist or I don't have a big megaphone trying to make a big statement. Um, I am trying to say that this is what America looks like. Uh, the diversity of people from different ethnicities, races, religions, languages, um, functional, dysfunctional, poor, rich, middle class, men, women, young, old, and, and, and I think in this small project uh, with its kind of satirical style um, is poking fun of a country that um, may turn away from its true identity, which is what it is. is um, there are a lot of black people who make this country great. There's a lot of immigrants from Mexicans to Iranians to all over the world who have made this country great. The Native Americans who have been neglected, very badly treated, and they are part of this um, tapestry. So, and, and the video, it's a kind of a narrative or a portrait of a nation of America. So you said that you're not an activist, but you make political work pretty much all the time. I wonder how that comes into being and how do they go hand in hand, you being a political artist and not an activist? I, I have to begin by saying that um, being born an Iranian and um, being someone that a revolution has defined my life um, as someone who had to leave the country and has lived outside of the country um, for so many years. And so my life has been defined by politics and. Um, my past, present, and the future, the way I impact, I live in exile. So politics has been um, something that I haven't been able to distance myself from. It's, it's, it's a very close proximity, where for a lot of artists, it's a choice if they want to touch political issues. Um, but at the same time, um, I'm not an activist. Uh, my work is politically charged in the way that it raises many questions, but it never provides answers. And I think that's really important. I've never ever um, been interested in realism or being able to, to convey an idea that I know something that more than others know. That what you see that is expressed through my work are a series of questions, whether about the Islamic revolution in Iran or the Egyptian revolution in Egypt or, or the, the, the state of America today, or these are issues relating to the, the current political climate, but there are also a series of questions and um, very highly conceptual work, you see? So they're not by any means uh, political statements. Mm -hmm. You said that you could not distance yourself from politics as an artist. Would you want to? I really uh, have no idea what that feels like if, let's say, I was from Switzerland or <laughs> Italy or somewhere where the artists, um, their psyche, um, it's free of any association with socio-political religious issues, where infinity could be their limit in terms of what they want to express, what they want to talk about. At the same time, I have to say that having come from Iran and having had certain hardship on a personal level because of the political reason. He's always been also 
a plus because I've been able to, to, to think about the world and above and beyond my own little small existence, you see. Um, I think that when you're an artist uh, who, who political reality is in such a close proximity to her everyday life, um, you can't help but always try to bridge what goes on in your inner and outer world. So I just don't see how I can ever make a work that it's only about me or my friends or, you know, it's always somehow rooted in the world, issues that are far bigger than me. And I'm, I'm grateful for that because that allows me to think about history, um, talk about religion, talk about poverty, um, talk about being minority, um, all kinds of issues um, that, it, that I've experienced, but at the same time it's not all about me. And, and I'm very happy about that. This is very interesting because obviously your works are very famous, revered, I'd say, uh, in, in, in a lot of the sense, but then you're a huge star yourself too. You're Shirin Neshat, the artist. Everything about you is, you know, as famous as your works. In that sense, um, obviously, even though your work is not autobiographical, it is very personal as much as political. Is that a problem sometimes that you star Shirin Neshat, the artist, sometimes may perhaps in some contexts overshadow your works? Well, I could say one thing that there's always a little bit of me or a lot of me in my work. Um, everything that I've ever made from a photograph or a video or a movie, the female characters have been about me. They even start to look like me. Um, the Land of Dreams, the woman character, uh, she's my own alter ego. These are my stories, these are my point of views. Uh, and, and this is, um, even on an aesthetic level, um, this is what I consider beauty. And, how I like to make myself up, how I like to dress, uh, how I look into more mystical, more um, poetic things in life. Um, so I think it's very difficult to separate who I am from my work. And I think in many instances in art history, I mean, I don't want to compare myself with legends like Frida Kahlo or uh, Louise Nevelson or there are a lot of artists that you cannot pull apart their lives as women, as um, political figures, as um, their relationships to their men, their children, or uh, their style, uh, and, and their persona, their public presence um, from their work. I mean, I'm a small um, example of it, but I think the audience feels that I put a lot of me in the work, a lot of my emotions, a lot of my personal melancholy and sadness and hard time, and people feel it. And I think, um, I think this is the most meaningful part of it, is that I'm very naked with my audience. Mm -hmm. And I think that speaks to them. And, and it's not just for Iranians. And I think that nakedness, that transparency, it's something that I am very grateful because it affects people very emotionally, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. It does make sense. Uh, I just want to explore further about the collective soul uh, of your work, as you've explained in the previous answer, but also the personal side. How do they come at play and do you sometimes perhaps find one taken over the other, or are you bothered by that? It's interesting because um, in the last maybe decade, I've been working um, in the way that I function like a reporter, and I put myself in communities, uh, very different than when you make work where you bring actors and you, you, know, you orchestrate everything. There is this element of throwing myself as an artist at unknown communities for me. And it's been really fascinating how I function. I find there is an element in me um, that has huge curiosities uh, about other people's lives, particularly poor and minorities. Um, I, I really feel 
in my absolute element when I'm around people who have suffered a lot, uh, whether economically or politically um, or however. And I, with my house is on fire in Egypt where I went after the Egyptian revolution and met many of the elderly who had lost a lot of their children um, because of the revolution. Or with this project when I went to visit reservations where a huge number of Native Americans live and, and understood the devast devastation that they lived and their history or the Mexican immigrants who uh, lived in absolute poverty and getting to know them and to know their issue or the black. I feel good to be feeling that my art takes me to communities that are disadvantaged and that I can, I can rep have a report on a human level. Um, that yes, it's true, I make artwork uh, and I show it, but it's really more than that. It's a human bonding and, and we give each other a lot. And um, so therefore I could say that maybe if I was in Iran and I never left Iran, I would have been a political activist. Maybe if my father didn't send me just before the revolution, I would have been one of those people who, you know, was really on the street level. Because I have this tendency to love to go inside of impoverished communities and care a lot about them. And do you think politicized art or socially politically conscious art can change anything? Or should it aim to change anything? Well, I think that it has changed me, and, and I think that if an artist um, puts an emphasis on the humanity of people of all kinds and makes work that um, communicates with the average art world about what lays behind the market and behind the money that basically dominates, and art becomes a way of communication, um, then that's a success, no? I think uh, artists are storytellers and um, artists are also kind of reporters. I, I see it that way. Um, and I feel that this body of work in many ways is speaking to the audience on a, in a deep level. And I think then, then it does something good, I think. I, I hope, I don't know, I, I'm just assuming, but at, that, at least that's my aim. Going back to you know your first works, I guess uh, not the latest uh, this Land of Dreams project, but I think one of the repeating criticisms is that you are looking at Iran, where you're from, with Western gaze. Obviously, you've heard of it. Um, some people see it as pure strategy to get Western attention using provocative subjects like women, Islam, feminism, and uh, tyranny, etc. How do you? approach that? What do you say to these criticisms? I think they're right. <laughs> um, I look at American people from an Eastern gaze <laughs> and I look at <laughs> Iran from a Western gaze because we just talked about earlier that I am this person of division, um, a hybrid identity. A duality is what defines me. I am uh, a person that has an identity conflict of Eastern, Western, so obviously if I'm looking at Iran and I'm sitting in New York, that's a Western gaze. But if I'm looking at a Native American from an Iranian perspective, that's an Eastern gaze. Um, and, and, and maybe they're right, maybe. But one thing I know they're wrong is that I never used it as a, as a tool to success. Um, but whether um, their point of view is correct or not, um, I, I think they're right. Um, but, but it's never been a strategy for success. But um, you know, have I used the veil as a, as a kind of a stereotypical idea, a cliche to, to approach idea of feminism? Um, no, because the veil is what the people wear in Iran. It's not something I made up. But have I used the veil since the woman of Allah? No, because my work doesn't deal with Islam anymore. Uh, I think woman of Allah was the last thing. But I think people's criticism still remains with the woman of Allah because that was my very first body of work. But uh, from then on, my, my work has always been about Iranian women outside of Iran. Mm -hmm. Very frankly, 
do you think that you were a challenging stereotypes against Iran in the Western world fully with your work, 100% full capacity? Or do you think sometimes maybe in direct or indirect ways you were submitting some of the preconceived notions? Listen, um, I can blame the ignorance of the West about Iran and say that, um, that their vision about Middle East, about Iran, uh, especially before 9-11, was so simplistic and so poor that they didn't even know the difference between Iran and Iraq and secular Islam versus non-secular Islam. It's not my fault that there's a level of absence of education about the, the, that part of the world and, and that no matter what I said through my work that the Iranian women are not victims, they're not submissive, they're not, um, you know, losers, that in fact they're rebellious and they're fighters and they're protesters, they still saw it as if the work is saying that the women are submissive. So uh, you were talking about a vastness of cultural misinterpretation that is lost in translation that no one like me can eradicate. Um, I am uh, an Iranian who started to surface in 1990. Um, 2001, we had September 11, and suddenly people became educated in America, and they began to understand the difference between you know, Iran and Iraq for the first time. They still think the Taliban's are Iraqis. I mean, the, the misperceptions in the world, especially in America, the ignorance is so vast that obviously my work fell into that channel of, of very stereotypical, reductive judgments, including the highest level of critics. Um, but at the same time, my work also fell short with the Islamic Republic of Iran, who couldn't understand the work. So I am an artist who is vastly misunderstood, especially the earlier work, both by the Westerners, the art critics, the public, and the Iranians and the Iranian government. But that's a lot because of their inability to understand what I was really trying to say. And what were you trying to say? I was, if you're talking about the earliest work, Women of Allah, I was framing the question about women who voluntarily became militants because of their faith to Islam. And I found that very paradoxical that a woman who gives birth and loves and loves God is willing to die and kill others for their devotion to religion. To me there was a contradiction, so it was a series of questions, not answers. And and so I showed the woman with the veil and with the gun and the text and um, and this was very perplexing for them. They they thought I was promoting um, you know revolutions and, and, you know, violence. And, and so it's a very complex, long subject to talk about. But what I'm saying is that probably why I moved on to not directly political work after that, because the, the reactions of people in the West and in the East were very reductive. It's very interesting. After the reactions you got uh, for your first works, earlier works, you thought that whatever you do, if you're work is highly politicized, it will always be perceived in a reductive way and you wanted to escape that. Yes, and, and this is, if you really look at my work carefully, after The Woman of Allah, my, I moved to videos like Rapture, Turbulent, my work became um, pure poems and became magic realism, surrealism, dreams. So I found that I could still be politically charged and, um, and, and really talk about some very dark um, um, subjects, but do it in a way that refuses to be, uh, remain in reality, refuses to be trapped in that kind of simplistic conversation, because dreams are innocent. Magic realism is not believable. You, you can kill someone, but you're innocent. So when you're dealing with a language that is not realism, like Woman of Allah was, you refuse to let people to judge you in those in those ways. And, and I think that um, 
from then on, I, I, I found my way. Well, let's leave it there. Thank you so much for um, coming on our show and speaking very honestly and from the heart, Shirin Nishat. Thank you.